This is lecture number 120 in the ABCs of Communism series, supporting volume 7, um, which will be forthcoming probably in January of uh, next year. Now, our subject now is French capitalism entering the imperialist phase. The French Third Republic capitalists built their imperialist empire in Africa and Indochina. France had a railway system efficiently supplying workers and raw materials to domestic factories and to the ships carrying capital to the colonies. The Rothschilds banking family of France guaranteed the role of Paris alongside London as a major center of international finance. From 1870 to 1914 and the outbreak of the capitalist Great War, they considered French farmers to be nothing more than the raw material destined to enter their factories. Afterwards, if they were radicalized along the way um, with the other proletarians coming under Marxist influence, they could be disposed of one way or another. In the event, it was to be as cannon fodder via universal military conscription. France continued to be divided into 80 departments with identical administrative structures. A prefect appointed in Paris governed each. Parisian appointee judges administered one standardized legal code with national police at their disposal. Education was centralized with the Grand Master of the University of France controlling every element of the entire educational system. New techno technical universities were opened in Paris that had the decisive role in training the new elite class. The old aristocracy still alive had returned, recovering much of the land they owned if they could fictionalize having worked some of it themselves. It was a matter of bribery. Nevertheless, they had lost their rights to the rest of the farmland and their former serf farmers. Of course, this parasitical aristocracy was politically reactionary and Catholic. Meritocracy was the cap regime's official and real policy, so they had to compete with the burgeoning business professionals and future financial masters of the universe. Anti-clerical sentiment was strong among this urban bourgeoisie and the capitalist farmers. The French centralized railroad system radiated from Paris with lines that cut east to west. After the big caps ate the small caps, there were six monopolies left. They dictated fares and finances through their national government. Their government's Department of Bridges and Roads brought in British engineers to oversee the construction work, planning, land acquisition, and the permanent infra infrastructure of track bed, bridges, and tunnels. It subsidized military lines along the German border. Private operating companies made millions contracting management, hiring workers, laying tracks, and building and operating stations. They purchased and maintained the rolling stock. In 1880, 6,000 locomotives were in operation in France that averaged 51,600 passengers a year, or 21,200 tons of freight each. Much of that equipment had been imported from Britain and did not stimulate machinery makers. They would have to wait until the second wave of shark feasting was handed to the capitalists. Financing was through the Rothschilds and their closed circus circle in the Paris Bourse. Nevertheless, the railroads were the essential transportation of France's Industrial Revolution. They made a national market for raw materials, wines, cheeses, and imported manufactured products. The freight trains were shorter and less heavily loaded than those were in Britain, Belgium, or Germany. Now, the 1872 census counted 36 million people, of whom 35.4 million were listed as Catholics, 600,000 as Protestants, 50,000 as Jews, and 80,000 as freethinkers. Entire regions, especially around Paris, had few priests. The religious comeback was very slow in the larger cities in industrial areas. In 1870 there were 56,500 priests representing a much younger and more dynamic force in the villages and towns with a thick network of schools, charities, and lay organizations. Conservative Catholics held control of the national government with secondary political roles elsewhere. From 1870 to 1913 the growth rates for 12 European and North American capitalist countries show France was in the middle. However, its population growth was very slow, next to the last place of Italy. Now, the 12 countries averaged 2.7% per year in total output 
but France only averaged 1.6 percent. The average size of the industrial undertaking was undertakings was smaller in France than in the others because its machinery was less sophisticated, resulting in lower productivity and higher uh, costs. And this persisted right on to the outbreak of the First Imperialist World War. French capitalists relied for their super profits on their exploitation of colonial Africa and Indochina, rather than on improved capital at home. Amongst French capitalists, the banking, sector, banking sector made Paris a world center for finance, along with London. The Rothschilds family was world famous, with the French branch led by James Mayer de Rothschilds, and uh, England had the other branch. The communication system was improved as roads were upgraded, canals were lengthened, and steamboat traffic became common. Industrialization was slower in comparison to Britain and Belgium. The railway system made a late appearance, and French industry was protected with tariffs, so there was little demand for entrepreneurship or innovation. The post-1871 French colonial empire consisted of the overseas colonies, protectorates, and mandate territories in Africa, Indochina, and the South Pacific. It ended with the loss of Vietnam in 1954 and Algeria in 1962. At its maximum, France and the colonies uh, that France claimed covered 4,400,000 square miles with about 100 million people. These imperial colonies supplied France with raw materials and consumed manufacturers. Of course, forced conscription provided the imperialists with manpower. The French settlers were given full rights and the natives none, excepting the comprador elite that worked for the invaders. From 1871 to 1914, France had nevertheless rebounded and become the centerpiece of the European alliance with a flourishing empire, second in size only to Great Britain. Its foreign policy was based on using the Catholic Church's missionary work to ideologically subvert the colonial peoples and on a fear of Germany, whose larger size and fast-growing economy could not be matched. It was revenge-seeking and demanded the return of Alsace and Lorraine. Simultaneously, however, the French and British came into conflict, conflict in Africa. Now, in 1898, the Fashoda incident featured French troops claiming an area in the southern Sudan and a British force sponsoring the Khedive of Egypt. The French withdrew, securing Anglo-Egyptian control over Egypt and the Sudan. The African continent was divided into spheres of exploitation, giving the Brits control over Northeast Africa while France exploited Morocco. France had suffered a humiliating defeat. How is that? Because the Suez Canal had been built by the French, becoming a joint British-French project in 1875. Both knew it was vital to maintaining their empires in Asia. In 1882, ongoing civil disturbances in Egypt prompted Britain to intervene. The Cap regime in London extended a hand to France that could not afford the cost of suppressing the revolt. That assistance had a cost. It was for Britain to take effective control of Egypt, finalized in the Fashoda outcome. However, the French capitalists had their colonies in Asia, and Japan was a possible ally. During his visit into France, Iwakura Tomomi, was willing to provide France with troops to advance its colonial occupation of Indochina in exchange for French military assistance. Accordingly, French military missions went to Japan in 1872 to 1880 and in 1884 to 1889. In 1884, conflict between China and the French imperialists over Indochina kicked off the two-year-long Sino-French War. Admiral Corbet destroyed the Chinese fleet anchored at Fuchao. The treaty ending the war put France in a protectorate over northern and central Vietnam, which it divided into Tonkin and Annam. Meanwhile, French bosses tried to put Russia and Great Britain into an anti-German alliance based on their mutual imperialist interests in cheap colonial labor and markets. First with the Franco-Russian alliance of 1894, then the 1904 Entente Cordiale with Great Britain. It was perfected with the Anglo-Russian Entente in 1907. This Triple Entente would challenge Germany for control of the world in 1914. Anti-German Propaganda 
1894, distrust of Germany and anti-Semitism led to the arrest of Captain Alfred Dreyfus. The essence of the Dreyfus affair was a false and totally contrived charge that as a French officer of the Jewish persuasion, he had colluded with the Germans, selling them military secrets. Far-right Catholic agitators inflamed the situation. When Emile Zola published an editorial on the fallacious case, the government charged him with libel. In 1906, Dreyfus was acquitted. However, the wreckage left behind a permanent modern stain on Germany in the minds of many French. Anti-Catholic propaganda. In 1878, Pope Leo XIII tried to calm church-state relations in France. In 1884, he told French bishops not to act in a hostile manner to the French government. And in 1892, he issued an encyclical advising French Catholics to rally to the Republic and defend the Church by participating in Republican politics. His attempts failed. In 1894, the Dreyfus Affair divided the nation between believers and Dreyfus innocents and others to believe the charges. The government fought with the Vatican over the appointment of bishops, chaplains were removed from naval and military hospitals, and soldiers were ordered not to frequent Catholic clubs. All 54 Catholic orders were dissolved, and about 20,000 of members immediately left France, many for Spain. In 1905, all church property was confiscated. Public worship was given to associations of Catholic laymen who controlled access to churches, and the church was badly hurt and lost half of its priests. <clears throat> and that brings us to a cultural revival for a few moments. From 1890 to 1914, France witnessed the beautiful epic of peace, prosperity, and the cultural innovations of Monet, Bernhardt, and Debussy. Par popular amusement saw the invention of the cabaret, can-can, and the cinema. These, along with Art Nouveau and Impressionism, were exciting new art forms. In 1889, the Universal Exhibition showed off newly modernized Paris to the world. A, Paris a person could look out over all of Paris and into the countryside from atop the new Eiffel Tower. Originally meant to be of transitory character, it was never removed, becoming France's most iconic landmark. The population grew held steady from 41 million in 1911 until the loss of millions of men in the Great War of 1914. The World at War In 1913, France extended mandatory military service from two to three years. On 25 July 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia and Russia mobilized. Germany was the best prepared. The German Empire was an ally of Austria and so declared war on Russia. France was allied with Russia and ready to go to war against the German Empire. On the 1st of August 1914, Germany and France ordered mobilization. They entered the imperialist war to kill millions of disgruntled domestic workers and seize as much of their competitors' markets and cheap labor as possible. The French socialist labor fakers of the Second International voted the war credits for the capitalist cap regime. German Social Democrats, led by the classical revisionist traders Edward Bernstein and Karl Kautsky, also betrayed their workers. Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg stood apart in the Reichstag, voting against the traders Bernstein and Kautsky's motion granting war credits for the caps. On the 3rd of August 1914, Germany declared war on France and sent its armies through neutral Belgium. Britain entered the war on 4 August and started sending troops on 7 August. Italy, although its capitals were tied to Germany, was initially neutral. In 1915, it rolled the dice and joined the Allies, UK, and France. The French economy was strategically damaged by the German seizure of its major northeastern industrial areas that produced 58% of its steel and 40% of its coal. In 1916, French credit collapsed and Britain began loaning, lo loaning large sums to Paris when J.P. Morgan in New York agreed to guarantee their repayment. Morgan got his government to make that guarantee good when the U.S. entered the war in 1917. The French economy rebounded with the arrival of over a million U.S. soldiers in 1918. 
they had to be fed and housed and all that had to be purchased on the French market. Labor shortages alleviated by three million imported forced laborers from the colonies, however. Germany's Schlieffen plan was too, to quickly defeat the French. They captured Brussels, Belgium, by the 20th of August and soon had captured a large portion of northern France. The original plan was to continue southwest and attack Paris from the west. By early September they were within 40 miles of Paris and the French government had relocated to Bordeaux. The Allies finally stopped the advance northeast of Paris at the Marne River in the battle that lasted from the 5th and 12th of September of 1914. The war now became a stalemate fought mainly in France. It was an immobile war of trenches despite extremely large and violent battles featuring ever more lethal mass killing technology. A vast area of interlocking defensive works featured opposing armies in static lines of defense stretching from the Swiss border in the south to the North Sea coast of Belgium. Both sides suffered hundreds of thousands of casualties and so the European world turned from September 1914 until March of 1918. The socialist leader Jean Jaurès was assassinated at the start of the war by the French Secret Service. Subsequently, the revisionist equivalents of Bernstein and Kautsky abandoned the French Socialist Party's anti-militarist positions and joined the national war effort. Prime Minister René Viviani called for a sacred union between the right and the left to win the war and the suborned traitors of the Second International went right along. In the meantime, V.I. Lenin had left his Geneva apartment for the library at Bern to restudy Hegel. He had to resolve it uh, and how it had been possible for the working class parties of social democracy to, in Europe to betray their sacred, sacred cause. And I'm going to pursue the outcome of his research in the next lecture. For now, however, by 1917, of the French army soldiers, most were reluctant to attack in what were certain death matches over the wall trench uh, into enemy machine gun and artillery fire uh, operations. Mutiny had stalled the capitalist war effort, and they eagerly awaited the arrival of millions of Americans. If J.P. Morgan was to be saved from bankruptcy, President Wilson had had no choice but to send the gringo troops. Germany planned an all-out assault in the spring of 1918 before the very rapidly growing U.S. Army played a role. In March 1918, Germany launched its offensive, reaching the Marne by May of 1918, and was again close to Paris. However, the Germans were soon pushed back. On the back foot this time, it was the German soldiers who rebelled, and they were joined by German sailors. The Kaiser was faced with the Bolshevik Revolution in his own country. Remembering the fate of his Tsarist relatives, he fled Germany. The government was then in the hands of the revisionist Social Democrat traitors who sued for peace and got an armistice that ended the fighting on 11 November 1918. The war ended for France with 1.4 million dead and 5 million wounded. The economy was in a shambles. The pre-war Northeast had produced 58% of the steel and 48% of the coal, and it was destroyed. Assistance came with the influx of U.S. food, mo money and food, and raw materials in 1970. The damages caused by the war amounted to about 113% of the GDP of 1913 chiefly the destruction of productive capital and housing. The national debt rose from 66% of GDP in 1913 to 170% of GDP in 1919, reflecting the heavy use of bond issues to pay for the war. Inflation was severe, with the franc losing over half its value against the British pound. Damage to factories and housing amounted to about 113% of the GDP of 1913. The national debt rose from 66 percent of GDP in 1913 to 170 percent in 1919, and as I say, the franc lost over half its value against the British pound. Leninism takes command. In October 1906, the Amiens Charter of the French Anarcho-Syndicalist anarcho Trade Union called the CGT was proclaimed at its Ninth Congress. Its main plank was the separation between the union movement and the political parties. 
In this, it differed fundamentally from Marxism and especially of Leninism. In 1909, leaders and hundreds of CGT members were killed by the French government of George Clemenceau. Clemenceau had sent the army with orders that its troops were to open fire on strikers. These French syndicalists before the war were against the cab bosses and their state apparatus. The majority of CGT component unions were impregnated with revolutionary spirit, but fatally handicapped by the doctrines of anarchism. Then, with the outbreak of the long-anticipated war, their workers took a new direction. The minority of those old days had become a majority. How was this shift brought about? Before the war, the orientation of the revolutionary syndicates was opposition to the impending war and to the army in general. Anti-militarism and anti-patriotism were the favorite platform of the advanced workers. Their leaders called for a general strike when the imperialists wa launched their inevitable war. They reproached the German syndicalists for not declaring themselves ready to employ the same tactics. They had nothing but disdain for U.S. trade unionists who they reproached for their adherence to Sam Gompers, whose only interest was in wages and hours. In the event, the syndicalists betrayed their members and submitted to the government. The syndicalist leaders feared government repression. In order to escape it, they adopted the official point of view, repudiating their pre-war ideas and promises, and were discredited forever. In short, the officials of the CGT adopted the posture of gompers. They carried with them the majority of the component syndicates and their leaders. The cat press had poisoned public opinion with lies about the causes of the war, that press and the treason of their union leaders meant they were to become collaborators in leading themselves to their own death. In November 1914, Pierre Monat raised his voice as protest against the war policy of the CGT and resigned from the executive committee. Alfred Rosmer, Dumoulin, representing the miners, Mirheim, secretary of the metal syndicates, Bouderon, secretary of the Federation of Toulouse, Paracat, Hubert, and a few others joined him. However, censorship and the state of siege stifled and paralyzed their statements. Making matters worse, as if that were possible, Merheim, Dumoulin, and Bordson defected to the regime in 1917, terrorized by the rise of Bolshevism in their own ranks. After the war, Monat and Rossmer took their place and restarted publication of their newspaper, Paracat carried on his activity, trying to found a new organ uh, called the Internationale and creating a Communist Party. The French Communist Party was founded in December 1920 by a split in the French section of the Workers' International, SFIO. They were answering Lenin's call to renounce the treason of the Second International and form the Third International. Accordingly, the revolutionaries of the French Social Democrat Party and its unions supported membership of the Communist International, or Comintern, founded in 1919 by Lenin after the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. The outbreak of World War I in 1914 sparked tensions within the S SFIO, when a majority of the SFIO took what left-wing socialists called a social chauvinist line in support of the French war effort. Gradually, anti-war factions gained an influence in that party, and Ludovic Oscar Frossard was elected General Secretary in October 1918. Additionally, the success of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia aroused hope for a similar communist revolution in France among the SFIO membership. <clears throat> in the spring of 1920, SFIO leaders Frossard and Marcel Kachin, director of the newspaper Le Manité, were sent to meet with Bolshevik leaders in Russia. They observed the Second Congress of the Communist International, during the course of which Vladimir Lenin enumerated the 21 points that were conditions for membership. Upon return, Frossard and Kachin recommended that the Revolutionary Socialists and the Social Democratic Party and its unions join the Third or Communist International. In December 1920, at the SFIO Tours Congress, this opinion was supported by the left-wing faction of Boris Souverine and Fernand Loriot, and the centrist faction of Ludovic Oscar Frossard and Marcel Kachin. Opposed was the right-wing Bernie Sanders equivalent faction led by Leon Blum. 
This majority won three-quarters of the votes from party members at the Congress. The revolutionary pro turn majority founded a new party known as the French Section of the Communist International, or SFIO, and its union, which became the SFIC. Both accepted Lenin's 21 points conditions for membership. Right-wing socialist parliamentarians and some local office holders were opposed to common turn membership and formed a rump SFIO with a much smaller membership than the SFIC but had a strong base of office holders and parliamentarians. The founders of the SFIC took with them the party newspaper La Humanité founded by Jean Charest in the General Confederation of Labor, CGT, trade unions, the communist minority split away to form the United General Confederation of Labor, CGTU, in 1922. The new Communist Party defined itself as a revolutionary party which used legal as well as clandestine or illegal means. The party organization was run under strict democratic centralism, which meant the minority were compelled to follow the majority. Membership was tightly controlled and dissidents purged from the party. Ho Chi Minh, who would create the Communist Party of Vietnam and then the Viet Minh, and then declared the independence of Vietnam, was one of the founding members of the Communist Party of France. When the gringo imperialist bosses decided to impose their will on Vietnam, none of them had the slightest idea of what they were up against, and they paid the price of their ignorance, as you well know. And that brings us to the end of this particular lecture. And after this, we're going to move on to a series of lectures on beginning with what Lenin de determined after his year-long study in the Bern Library, the Bolshevik Revolution, and that's going to be like four lectures, I think.